If you look at my primary school graduation book from 1993, you'll see under my photo that I had two dreams. One, to play in the NBA, and the other, to work as a creative in advertising. I was 12 at the time, and certain this was a career for me. Sit in a room and come up with ideas all day. Now how good would that be? When I dreamt of making ads, it was so easy. There was only a few mediums you had to fill with your idea. The 30-second TV spot, a 30-second radio ad, a press ad, half page or full page, an outdoor billboard, and maybe some direct mail. There was no websites, no pre-rolls, nothing like that. Now, the way media worked back then, advertisers had the luxury of a captive audience. It was like a fish in a barrel, at least according to media companies. People had to patiently sit through the commercial breaks during their favourite TV shows. They didn't have a choice. Sure, most of us went to make a glass of Milo during the ad breaks, but the point is we got used to four minutes of ads every ten minutes of our favourite shows. So if it was so easy for advertisers to get our attention then, why is it so hard for them today? Nobody says it better than Kevin Spacey in his speech at the 2013 Edinburgh Television Festival. I imagine that the audience then probably went home at the end of the festival and shared that time-honoured tradition when the entire family would gather around the television set, tune to a certain channel at a certain time, and watch a favourite movie like It's a Wonderful Life. And they probably felt blessed to be living in such a modern age with a 21-inch television that brought the family together. Today, when I think about how all of you might go home after the festival, you can sense that things are a little bit different now than they were then. It's more likely you've already recorded It's a Wonderful Life on your DVR as you gamely try to gather the family around the giant movie screen that you've installed in what used to be the garage. Then you can try to find out where your children are on Facebook. You might ask your partner to stop Instagramming photos during the movie of the meal that they've just ordered from the delivery service. While Grandma desperately pins even more pictures of cats on her Pinterest page, as your son quietly and surreptitiously clears his entire browser history, and your daughter tweets how boring It's a Wonderful Life is because it's not in 3D or even in color, you too will feel that warm family glow of precious time when we all come together to basically ignore each other. It is indeed a more complicated, modern, and wonderful life, isn't it? So if we're all ignoring each other, and for the most part the television, what hope do ads have of being effective? Well, not much. This episode, we look at how we are living through the last days of advertising as we know it, and how agencies are attempting to adapt and continue to grow their clients' business. Gone are the days of where one ad fits all. Technology has changed everything. Technology has given the punters control. We choose what we watch and when. The internet has totally infiltrated our living rooms and as a result, we have made our choice. My name is Tommy McCubbin and this is Future Sandwich Episode 4, Skip Ads. Speaking to a hall full of TV's heavyweights, Spacey continues to talk about the new model to make and distribute TV content and highlights how big an opportunity this is. Now, clearly the success of the Netflix model, releasing the entire season of House of Cards, at once proved one thing. The audience wants the control. They want the freedom. If they want to binge, as they've been doing on House of Cards and lots of other shows, then we should let them binge. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have stopped me on the street and said, thanks, you suck three days out of my life. (laughs) And through this new form of distribution, we have demonstrated that we have learned the lesson that the music industry didn't learn. Give people what they want, when they want it, in the form they want it in, at a reasonable price, and they'll more likely pay for it rather than steal it. Well, some will still steal it, but I think we can take a bite out of piracy. Now people have control, and we're choosing to binge, we are also choosing to skip the ads. Find me a person on the planet who would choose to see ads during their favourite TV show. But it's not all doom and gloom for ad agencies. While technology poses a huge threat, it brings with it some of the most exciting opportunities brands have ever had. Advertising is the reason why the likes of Google, YouTube, Facebook are all valued in the hundreds of billions. Author Steve Sammartino, who spent many years as an ad man, tells us why we have agencies and how they can adapt to survive. Well, I think the role of agencies was always about letting the people know who need to know about something. And that creates value, right? Because I've bought things and seen things and participated in events or that I've been advised to through media my whole life. And 
informing people of things has always had value and always will. It's just that it used to be, it used to be that we would yell at everyone and hope the right people hear it amongst the yelling. Seth Godin does a really great um, kind of bit on mass media. It's kind of yelling at the public because there's limited channels and everyone tunes into those channels because that's all there is and we hope that the right people hear. Right? But I think, that, uh, I think that the communication and the media channels of agencies needs to get more niche. It's still going to be mass because you still need to reach a large number of people. But they need to work out ways to do more personalised message based on the invite from the person who hears the message right, to give them the stuff that they want to hear about. And that involves more fragmented creative and more fragmented media. And that's harder, and it's really hard because it's less profitable. Because as soon as you have to touch more things, how do you make as much money? Because it's really easy, you have one creative and five channels, right? Dude, that's, that's awesome. That's why agencies were so profitable and, you know, during the heyday. And that's why it's tougher now. And I don't think there's been a huge amount of adaptation yet. I, I mean, I look at it and I still mostly see the old model. And I think that's clients as well. Because you've got to have, you know, clients... Um, my former CEO used to say clients get the advertising they deserve, which, <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. But I think it's really... They still need mass. They have to work out a way to deliver a mass message but the message needs to be personalised for everyone. And that's really hard. And I don't know the answer to that. You touched on something interesting there about getting permission to continue the conversation. Yes. Therefore, you don't have to pay for media to reach those people going forward. Yeah. That whole hoping the right people hear it. Yeah. Shift from hoping the right people subscribe to it. That's right. Yeah, I don't I, see enough of that. You don't see any push. of that. I can't... It's still push. It's mostly still push. And it's, it, if I was to look at the brands that do it the best, I think people who operate, who might be a independent kind of operator, you know, like a Gary Vee or a Seth Godin or whoever, who get people to subscribe to what they do. And, some, and a lot of small brands do it really well, where they want people to subscribe to their newsletter. I'll just use the newsletter as an example, but it could be their whatever, right? Subscribe because they're into this brand or into this company. Right? And some of them do it on Instagram, but that, again, that's kind of thin. It shouldn't be just about information. It should be like, I'm into what you do. I'm part of your business community where we buy and sell and make stuff together. And I think that one of the great ways to do that, if I was to think about the best way to get permission marketing, is actually not to get someone just to sign up so that you can talk to them. The best way is to get someone involved in your business so they help you make stuff. Right? And the best examples of that is... Google do it, right? Hi, here's our ad platform. You get involved in our ad platform. You're going to help us grow. You're our customers, right? And we're handing over the tools of production to you. So this co-creation and participation is the best way to advertise because we're both touching the product together. Apple do it, right? Think about it, you know, with their app store. They're saying, hi, here's how... Here's our garage, right, where we make cars. Here's all the tools and the whatever. There's some rules on how to use the tools, but welcome in and go make some cool shit and we'll um, give, you know, we'll just take 30% of your profit. But we're giving you access to all our customers, all our tools, all our ecosystem and everything, right? And so then that's a better way to talk to people than just saying, here's a permission database so I can just tell you what I'm about to sell you. Better than that, here's the things I'm making. Can you help me make it? And then let's talk to each other and make something together. And then they become sales agents as well as... So that co-creation, I don't reckon any big companies have really done that beyond a little campaign-y kind of thing. They've got to move out of that campaign idea. Like, I don't know why the banks don't open up and say, listen, we're going to open up part of our API for startups to involve us in the blockchain and Bitcoin and whatever. I've got no idea why they don't do that. And it's mostly fear. So what does the agency of the future look like? there are many shapes they come in. The agency I work for now doesn't resemble anything like the agencies I interned for 15 years ago. We have a newsroom that's full of editors. We have a team that shoot video at a moment's notice, edit and upload within 20 minutes. The digital department is the biggest department in the agency, and in the 18 months since I've been there, it's gone from 18 to over 70 people. I caught up with Sasha Markova from Mother London. We had a taco in LA, and she just recently landed from the UK. Um, well, it's very, it's very early days, and, and literally, I just got off the boat maybe nine days ago uh, with this. But um, we don't want to just come out here and um, set up another advertising agency. Now, Mother is a brilliant agency, 
Born in Shoreditch in London, now with offices in New York and San Paolo, Mother have done some world-famous work for Diet Coke, Ikea, and they created global vernacular such as Pim's O'Clock. I guess what Mother did 18 years ago when we first set up was we, um, we changed the rules of advertising. So, so we took advertising away from desire, away from if you buy this you might feel sophisticated, you might be sexy, you might be whatever. And, and we changed it to, actually, here's a human truth about yourself and, and we recognise that in this product and, and you are you and it's okay. It was very human. And nobody had done advertising like that before. And I think we kind of got lost in the last few years. We were thinking, fuck, we've got, sorry, we've got, to, be, we've got, to, be, we've got to be tech savvy, we've got to know about digital, we've got to do everything like that. And actually now, what we're thinking about is the future relies on, on us being more human than ever and celebrating humanity. And in the age where, you know, AI is 20 years from taking over, to contribute to building towards a greater human intelligence. So as we get smarter, so do the ad placements. There's a thing called banner blindness, where people's brains have actually been trained to not look at banners as they surf the web. So publishers have created native ads where brands pay to create ads that look like articles. Some platforms do a great job. If you go to Quartz or QZ.com, they're my favourite. Here's Sasha on native ads. See, you go onto something like Vice, and it's, it's, it's an advert, you know, and it, it, it is. And, and it's sort of, you go onto something that you, 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 you used to trust as subculture, and now it's mainstream culture selling subculture. And it's, it's the lines of blood, and I kind of feel with advertising... You know, I don't think it. I don't think we win by tricking anybody or creeping in that way. And actually, the thing that you said that we were we were something interrupting great experiences. You know, that's always what we've been. Now, I think we need to be the great experience that is interrupting a humdrum reality. You know, and, and that's what that's what we need to do. So you'll notice Sasha never mentioned ads as part of her plan. You see, agencies can't get away with just making ads. An ad is only saying something. And to get people's attention, you really need to do something to prove you mean what you say. Because now people can skip your ad, and there are endless options for on-demand programming that don't feature any ads. Advertising is not the only revenue stream for media owners and creators. We are willing to pay a few bucks here and a few bucks there to watch what we want, when we want, all without ads. Those brands that have seen this coming and started making the content we want to watch like Red Bull Media, they make a profit from the films they make and release at the box office. Intel, holding hands with Vice, made the Creators Project, a content platform where technology meets creativity. They achieve the holy grail by winning a Webby for branded content and for art content. They are winning at both, and that is effective. The audience wins, and the brand wins, and the agency wins. So, what will TV look like in the future? The good news is, ads will be better, because they will know who you are. They'll be aware of what you like, what time of day it is, your location, and they'll serve up branded messages that appeal to you at that moment. So remember the scene from Minority Report when Tom Cruise walks through the mall and the posters are scanning his retina. At the time, he's another character, John Anderton. But what's important is they recognise him and the content adapts and talks directly to him. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, no is the road, one less traveled. So how it'll work is, for example, me being a guy, I will never see a tampon ad. I will only ever see beer ads. But never in the morning, only in the afternoon when I start feeling like one. If I watch TV with my wife, we'll see a trailer for a romantic comedy. But if she gets up to make tea, I'll see a trailer for an action thriller. Keep in mind, I'll always pay a few dollars to watch ad free and on demand. So it's likely I won't see any at all. So that's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, I don't think it is bad but a lot of people do. It's privacy. The fact that whenever you go on the internet, whatever you watch on Netflix, data is being collected about you and your behaviour. This is being packaged up and sold to brands to use to target exactly who they want, when they want, and minimise the wastage of ad dollars. 
I'm happy to trade my data for the abundance of free services I have. I use and love Gmail and am aware that my mail is scanned for keywords to trigger ads. For example, when I'm flying to Sydney, my flight details will be sent to my email and then I'll see ads for events in Sydney when I'm going. Or if I mention my dog Cooper, I'll see wholesale dog biscuits on the side of my inbox. So for agencies, this is a huge opportunity to get more efficient, but I've been depressed at the thought that all this data and science will kill the art, kill the creativity. I grabbed a burger with Nick Hodges, Head of Innovation at News Corp, and we discussed whether data-driven media will stifle the creativity of the ads. I think the, the key might be in that question, which is data-driven. Uh, I think the phrase data-driven is a terrible phrase. It points to a future where we have uh, enough surveillance of people, collecting enough data in our DMPs, um, the, uh, and you know, being connected across cross device, you know, wizardry, and and then you know, people looking at a specific piece of content, and then an advertiser, you know, taking place in a hundred millisecond auction of of an ad space, and there's been all this chat around you know, data driven advertising, and it's it's a terrible phrase uh, because I think what people really meant uh, was data informed. And creativity has has essentially been a victim of of, of incorrect semantics. <laughs> if you if we could go back, you know, five years and and stop everyone saying data driven, and get them to say data informed, then creativity would be in such a different place than it is right now. Um, because when creativity becomes informed by data, it's, it's amazing. Um, we're we're able to create ideas that just wouldn't have happened before you know they, uh, to, to sort of steal a jobsism which I try not to very often you know data can act as a bicycle for an idea uh, but we can't use data to drive an idea we can only use it to inform an idea so um, hopefully that starts to change because I think most people are jack of data um, it's, it hasn't delivered what it promised. I don't think it's insignificant, but I don't think the data-driven world ever came about. Um, and instead, we ended up with ad tech, and that's just a complete sort of cluster cuss. So, um, I think we, I think we'll hopefully see a sway back to to creativity and understanding the value of creativity, and you know, hopefully, it is data-informed creativity. All you need to do is look at how advertising is now awarding itself. In the most prestigious award show in Cannes, the most talked about and awarded work is products such as Nike Fuel Band, Optus Clever Boy, or Intel's Creators Project. Stuff like that doesn't even resemble ads. So we advertising agencies are listening, maybe because we have to, but maybe because we think we can do a better job at selling our clients' products. I can't wait for the day I can watch any form of content on any device and know I won't have to wait for an ad or an ad break to finish. The only hope is it's one of my clients that have made the content I'm actually choosing to watch. I'm Tommy McCubbin and this is Future Sandwich, Episode 4, Skip Ads. So a big thanks to Sasha from Mother and also to Kevin Spacey for borrowing his speech. And thanks to Nick Hodges for his chat. You can find him at Nick Hodges, that's Nick N-I-C, or subscribe to his brilliant newsletter, The Brief. You can find that at blonde3.com, that's the number three. And thanks to Steve Sammartino. You can buy The Great Fragmentation on Amazon. I really recommend it. Find Steve on Twitter also, at Sammartino, S-A-M-M-A-R-T-I-N-O, and follow his blog, startup.wordpress.com. You can see all the crazy stuff he's done on there. And most importantly, Matt Thompson for editing this like a boss. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Future Sandwich on iTunes or follow on SoundCloud. Or you can get the episode sent directly to your inbox by signing up at futuresandwich.com. Also, give me a shout on Twitter, at T McCubbin. I'm always up for hearing what you think or any suggestions of people I should talk to who are making the future happen today. 